Uh, hey, Emily, I think we need to um, switch. Your, some, something about your um, video settings isn't syncing with YouTube somehow quite right. Oh. Uh, we're just going to take a second just to switch your settings okay. before we start the live stream. Um, so I don't have to do anything, right? Not yet. Um, OK. So let's see. Dan, yeah. yeah. Explain. Um, oh, we are fine. Go ahead. OK. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Entrepreneurial Thought Leaders series. My name is Emily, and I'm excited uh, for a third session this winter. The Entrepreneurial Thought Leaders series is presented by the Stanford Technology Ventures Program, which is the Entrepreneurship Center in the Stanford School of Engineering, and BASIS, which is the Business Association of Stanford Entrepreneurial Students. Today, I am delighted to welcome Stephanie Lampkin to ETL. Stephanie is a TEDx speaker and former downhill ski racer, and also the founder and CEO of Blendor, which creates enterprise software that leverages augmented intelligence and people analytics to mitigate unconscious bias in hiring. Lamkin's work has been featured in The Atlantic and Forbes, and she has appeared on Fortune's 40 Under 40 list and the MIT Technology Review's 35 Under 35 list. Her 15-year career in the tech industry has included founding two startups and working in technical roles at Lockheed, Microsoft, and TripAdvisor. She holds a bachelor's in science and management engineering at, from Stanford and an MBA from the MIT Sloan School of Management. Welcome, Stephanie, to ETL. Before we dive into a fireside chat, I was hoping that you could give us an overview of Blendor for those of us who may not know what it is. Absolutely. Um, thank you everyone for having me. It's really great to be here. Um, I was in your seats 15 or so years ago, uh, and this is actually when BASIS first got started. Um, obviously not actually in your seats. I was on Stanford campus, um, but it's really excited to be on the other side of, of the table. So I'm going to go ahead and start my slides. Is that okay, Emily? Absolutely. Okay, great. And we're off. Okay, so as mentioned, I am the CEO and founder of Blendor. I'm just gonna kind of take you through the journey of the company and what we've done and what we're doing and what's coming next. Uh, so I started coding actually really early. Uh, here's a picture of me at a hackathon uh, as a teenager before it was really called a hackathon. I've been coding since I was 13 um, and took AP computer science in high school and uh, did a lot of uh, software engineering work throughout college. Um, so as mentioned, I went to Stanford undergrad, MIT for grad school, um, and worked for like a Fortune 500 company for the most part all throughout undergrad, landed a job at Microsoft and did some work at TripAdvisor. Um, but about six months after I graduated from MIT, I interviewed for an analytical lead job at a very well-known Silicon Valley company, and they told me not qualified. Um, so it was the first time in my life as a ridiculous overachiever, really being confronted with um, what felt like uh, wasn't a meritocratic process. Um, and a lot of that, I realized at that moment, had been happening throughout my experience in, in corporate America in tech, not just in recruiting, but in a lot of other facets of, uh, of being in the working world. So. Um, I later found out that that company, along with several others, was really struggling to diversify their workforce. They're about 2% Black, 3% Latino, and about 30% female across the board. Um, but the common narrative was it's a pipeline problem. We just can't find qualified women and people of color. They're not getting the, the degrees. Um, and obviously, I knew that not to be the case. Um, my auntie actually earned a computer science degree in 1984 from the University of Maryland, when about a third of all computer science degrees went to women. Um, so I identified that there was uh, friction in the marketplace um, connecting uh, talent. And so I built the first version of Blendor literally in my mom's basement. Um, it took me about two months to ramp up on, on, uh, on the stack and moved, to, moved back to Silicon Valley and got into Stardex about nine months or so uh, after uh, creating that first MVP, minimum viable product. Um, and then also took advantage of another really great accelerator called SAP.io. Uh, so fundamentally the problem we started off solving was unconscious bias. So the fact that you could have a resume with identical names and yield a two X difference in response rate, uh, depending on the ethnic 
sounding of the name. Um, and just further research sort of going into un and understanding the impact of unconscious bias and resume review. So we went ahead and created a job matching app, uh, connecting companies with diverse talent, but also removing the name, the photo, any indication of age or gender or race, uh, algorithmically matching candidates based on the things that matter, like skills and education and experience. Um, and that's how it started. So now I'm going to tell you how it's going. So seven years later, or seven years since companies started measuring this data, uh, but six years since we started, there's been only a 3% increase in women um, in some of these workforces and almost stagnant when it comes to underrepresented minorities. And again, the narrative that we're seeing year over year, it's a pipeline problem. Well, actually about two thirds of all college degrees go to women now. Women have officially surpassed men in terms of education. And when we look at entry level talent, it's a bit more on par than a lot of people realize. But when you get further and further up, um, the latter is when things gradually dec decline. And this is most significant for women and most even more significant for women of color. Um, and so as much as we want to respect that companies are trying their best and they're still working on it, um, I realized that there was a bigger opportunity for us to make an impact. Um, and so, you know, we started under the Obama era when everything was great and then Trump hit. And believe it or not, business started to boom because I think it awoken people to what was happening, the realities in this country. And then 2020 hit. So we saw this young lady be Breonna Taylor, be killed in her sleep. Uh, we saw this gentleman die in about eight minutes. Um, and I really saw myself in this people. So this is Sandra Bland. She's college educated. She was on her way to a job and this gentleman pulled her over. And I've seen this space before. So while driving in San Francisco, I've been racially profiled. Um, I'm a private member at a club called The Battery, where some of my guests have been discriminated against and asked to leave under false accusations. So despite the fact that I appear on the covers and I'm getting awards, I am constantly living under the threat that at any point in time, somebody can take my life in an instant and pay no price for it. So it. It, 2020 kind of because of COVID and many other things led me to a bit of a point of just reevaluating what role I was playing and Blendor was playing in a lot of the optics companies were, were um, managing around diversity, equity, and inclusion. So we decided to double down on this index, this rating and ranking system that I initially built for customer acquisition purposes. And it worked beautifully. Because we made this diversity score public, companies all of a sudden came out of the woodwork. And instead of wanting to understand how to buy a better unbiased hiring solution, they were more interested in their score and how they could appear better. Um, and so it really threw me into the understanding that, oh, this isn't a hiring problem, this is a social problem. And the way companies are thinking about social right now is through ESG, which is basically the financial services interest in how companies for good also lead to profitability. And then on the corporate side, this little known uh, uh, space called corporate social responsibility, where companies talk about their carbon footprint and how they're being good glo global citizens after all. So I realized that there was a much bigger opportunity for us to fit some of the DEI analytics within the scope of these existing frameworks for measuring and mon monitoring how well companies were just being good citizens in the world, treating people fairly, paying people fairly, hiring people fairly, um, and how that could impact their employer brand. So this is really a big reset for us to get away from hiring and the masking of names and unconscious bias, with which people get to really hone in on like the social problems behind this. So we've been collecting this data for about six years. It's all based on publicly available information like the makeup of your board, your executive team. We aggregate it, we normalize it. For any of you management science and engineering majors, I think it was MSNE 180 or MSNE 108. Stochastic modeling, It's this is like we have modeled basically how likely a company is going to experience a lawsuit um, attrition, involuntary resignations, or bad press, just based on publicly available information that we're able to gather about the demographic makeup of their companies and the policies, benefits, programs, initiatives that they have in place, focused on treating people fairly. And this is the biggest weakness we see, is the lack of diversity on the leadership. 
Though white women primarily have made significant gains over the past seven years in terms of representation, everybody else has been left out of the party and we now have the data to show that. So what we sell to companies is, I kind of call it like a credit karma for diversity. So we show you your score and the breakdown of your score, and we give you recommendations on how to improve your score. And what this is, is not just branding, if you really think about it, we're teaching companies how to operationalize DEI, much the same way that they optimize for revenue, much the same way that they optimize for employer happiness. We're teaching them how to optimize for creating in workplaces that people will be proud of um, and people will have an equally likelihood of succeeding. And so we're kind of in this risk and brand management space. And I also realized that the, there is a need for finding people like me and other executives that a lot of companies seem to not have access to, which I think is primarily due to their social networks. A lot of executives go from boarding school to Stanford, to Google, to Facebook, to starting a company, and they're interacting with the same people over and over and over again, continuously validating the thesis and they have that they have that it's a pi pipeline problem. And it's not a pipeline problem. It's just that you don't know us. And frankly, we don't want to work for companies where we're not likely to succeed because we have been succeeding in almost every other facet of our lives, but this one. And so I've tried to map our original sort of bias mitigating technology, but enabling companies to strictly focus on identifying diverse leadership that can help guide them in a very operational way and not just this intense focus on hiring. So fundamentally what we're trying to do is create a recognized brand that gives companies sort of like a badge of approval around being a fair company to work for. We've seen this with US News World Report and the way that they use rankings to um, help people find colleges. Uh, we've seen this with LEED in terms of finding a green building. Um, our goal now is strictly fo focused on employer branding. And the timing is right, right? We've seen a ton of Black Lives Matter statements and pledges. We've even seen this in the financial sector, uh, institutional shareholder services wrote a letter to all of their clients that they now have to publicly share the racial and demographic makeup of their board and their executive team. We see a lot of pledges. Probably the biggest one last year was NASDAQ um, proposing to the SEC that they would delist companies who do not publicly share the demographics of their board. So that's big. Um, and, you know, I believe in, you know, drinking our own Kool-Aid. So our team reflects exactly the mission that we are going after um, in terms of diversity and demonstrating the benefits of diversity. Um, we also have a very diverse candidate set, over 1 million profiles and resumes in our database, spanning all career levels and race and gender um, identities and functions and majors. Um, We've generated over about four million dollars served in revenue, served over um, 232 companies, uh, and we've actually raised a modest amount of venture capital. And if anyone wants to know why, I'm happy to share. But uh, while about two percent of venture capital goes to female founders, uh, 0.06 percent goes to uh, black female founders. So there's only about 90 or so black women in the world ever to raise a million dollars or more in venture capital. And, and we're just lucky to be one of them. So our goal long-term is to be this trusted source of truth for people, primarily to be honest, Gen Z and millennials that are way more woke, um, also known as socially conscious, who want to work for and invest in companies that are doing well. And so you can come on our platform and identify yourself by gender, by race, by socioeconomic background, um, by foreign uh, national um, status, whatever. And we can tell you exactly what companies you're likely to belong in and succeed in and that align with your core values. Um, Here's a little data joke for any of you nerds out there. This is all built on data. I am bullish about leveraging public objective information, which is why we aren't in the glass door space, though shout out to those of you who realize that Blendor was named after Glassdoor. Um, we're not yet getting into the review space because there's so much data out there now that I think could be really revelatory and we wanna build on that. 
Um, and so for any of you that are data nerds, we are hiring, so please reach out. Um, and that's it, you know, our motto is, is work fair. Um, I don't think any of you would want to go to a university where you knew that women who did the same amount of work were gonna get less grades or be less likely to make it to sophomore year. So why would you work for a company like that? Amazing, amazing. Stephanie, thank you so much for sharing such an in-depth view of the, the product, the metrics that you're developing for employers to get better at what they do. You know, it triggered a lot of thoughts for me. And I wanted to ask, you know, Blendor gets us through the first part, right? So, you know, the recruiting, the sourcing, like, and, and, and you actually mentioned in a talk some time ago that um, diversity programs often fail. And, and I'm wondering if after, you know, candidates arrive and are onboarded, like what can companies do to succeed in, in increasing diversity in their companies? Uh, in, and, and what hasn't worked in, in, in given, given your expertise in this area? Um, there's a lot. Um, and again, we're a data company, so I can't give you too much qualitative information but I can tell you just based on what we've crowdsourced, uh, what seems to be successful among the companies who are winning in this space. Um, so the companies that seem to be doing really well at hiring and retaining many different types of people are very intentional about the ways that they structure interviews being graded and rated on the exact scale. They also ensure that the panels of reviewers are diverse so you just don't have one demographic of people responsible for all final hiring decisions. Um, and you also see a very intentional effort around um, career development, interview preparation. Um, so one of the things that, that's unique about, um, for example, uh, English as a second language um, or people who are first generation college students is that they could be just as smart and even more so than their peers, but communication isn't their strong suit. They did not grow up in a house where um, the same language was spoken for whatever reason. And so I've seen a lot of companies um, in, in recognition of that put in certain you know, uh, systems in place, whether it be interview prep or a, like a, a peer mentorship program with someone who's already in the company to kind of help them. Um, and, and I've seen those sorts of things be really successful. Now, in terms of what does not work, um, marketing. Marketing does not work. I think a lot of companies uh, sort of rest this whole DEI space within the, the marketing and communication. So they publish these really fancy reports every year. They have a chief diversity officer who goes to a lot of conferences and speaks about a lot of things, but that's all they do. Um, mm -hmm. and in a lot of cases, that can have a counterproductive effect and um, actually moving the needle. Amazing. Uh, if I flip the question around, I'm curious, let's say uh, I am a student and I am uh, a, a historically underrepresented, you know, member of a historically underrepresented group, and I'm going through the process with the company. What can I do on my end to be more successful through the interview process, the onboarding process, and to be, you know, successful, uh, you know, in the end? in my career at a particular company? Yeah, it, it's honestly not that dissimilar from the process that many of you went through when applying to college. I'm sure you spoke to alum. I'm sure you did a ton of research and identifying like what are the skills and characteristics of people who typically get admitted into this school. Um, you may have even uh, done a little bit of prep work, uh, whether it be for your, your SATs or, or whatever standardized tests. It's, it's very similar, um, you know, go and find folks cold call, cold email, um, folks uh, within and, without, and outside of your network to just get tips and understand what are the things that they're looking for. Um, obviously, you don't want to overinflate your skills that will backfire. Um, but at minimum, it could even reveal the things that you may need to develop before you apply. Um, so again, very similar to the college application process. Mm -hmm. uh, quick note, Steph, I, I know this is a technicality. Could you triple check your video? 
I, I, we, we want to make sure that the students can see you. So we're just going to pause for a quick moment here. Thanks, everyone, for your patience. For those of you who are watching, we'll be right back. We're just going to reboot in this time of COVID. Uh, these things happen, so uh, we'll be right back. Quick stretch break, bathroom break, whatever you need. All right, everybody's had a stretch break. That's <laughs> Sorry right. about that. I just sent a text message to everybody in the house to stop streaming videos for 20 minutes and hopefully uh, <laughs> hopefully that will help. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome back. Welcome back. I'm uh, I'm 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 glad we all took a moment to recognize how much time we spent in front of our screens uh, during this you know, COVID era. Actually, speaking of which, I know you run a substantial team uh and and what have you done actually speaking of which during this era of COVID times to you know help them i mean there's a lot that has happened since since last march um how have you you know kept up the morale how have you helped people adapt how how has this period impacted lendor other than you know some really positive shifts that we've seen that you've presented on already yeah, well, business-wise, there's there's definitely been an impact. It's kind of been a roller coaster. Um, but uh, in terms of employee morale, you know, it's been t it's been tough because everyone's family situations are different. Everyone's living situations are different, and so I've tried to make a concerted effort to kind of meet with everyone one on one to just let mm -hmm. them know that you know we are sensitive to your unique circumstances, and if at any point in time you know you need to take a break or you need to have um, time for whatever you need. We're totally understanding and, and empathetic in this moment. Um, and then just like some funny little hacks, like we obviously use Slack. And so um, I've encouraged everyone to uh, use uh, Giphy. So to just put like funny little gifts in the chat that are relevant and we'll, we'll, we'll we like send out awards every month for who, whoever's had the funniest gifts. Um, and then more recently we sent like care packages to everyone just consisting of all sorts of fun like little you know just like little stuff you get in college that are just cute and inexpensive but just make you feel thought of um so so yeah it's it's been challenging but um i think the biggest thing is just um showing empathy and and you know and care do you think the mission for your staff has do you think this year has emboldened your staff with respect to your mission and and maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that. I know it's you, you shared a little bit of content uh, during your presentation about that. Um, how, how has the response been on that front? Yeah, very much so. I think, um, you know, particularly after the murder of George Floyd, because everyone was at home when it happened, it landed uh, really hard. Um, I actually had an investor who, um, who's Southeast Asian, he called me years um, around what happened. And honestly, I didn't understand it because to me, what happened to George Floyd was just as bad as what happened, um, you know, to Michael Brown and, and, and a lot of others. But I realized because we are home and because people are watching it over and over and over again, um, things are just landing different and, and we're just way more connect, connected to our um, vulnerability and humanity in, in these moments now more than ever. 
So, um, so yeah, everyone is just super empowered and passionate because I think they realize like the bigger things that matter. Um, and, you know, and also it's around this whole point of employer brand. I think a lot of people who are working in big tech are just reevaluating how what they're doing might be in misalignment with their core values. Yeah. People who work for companies like Blendor, I think, feel really um, lucky to not only to be able to make a living, but do something that is just on the right side of history. Yeah, here, here. How lucky they are. How lucky they are. How do you recruit? Do you use Blendor to recruit to Blendor? Is it like oh. that? So Blendor is really not optimized for startup hiring. Startup hiring is way more high touch um, than than large than a large public company. Uh, so I do I, I recruit through a few different mediums, um, primarily through like alumni networks, so Stanford, MIT, even Berkeley, um, and a few others. And then I do quite a bit of speaking and just sort of like um, leveraging public social presence uh, to just put out there what we do and we just get a ton of inbound interest. So I would say a good 75% of, of the people who work at Blendor just found us because they read an article or they saw me speak at an event or um, you know they saw us post through some alumni network. Fascinating, fascinating. Um, so maybe I could go to the other end of the spectrum now. There was a slide that you presented that reminded me of a study that McKinsey did uh, in 2016, I believe, on just how at the when we get to the very, very top, there's very, very few uh, individuals who make it to that executive level who are uh, part of the historically underrepresented groups. Um, Maybe could you share a little bit more about uh, what you're doing in that space and, and how you've shifted some attention there? Because I continually see that as a, a, a challenge for big companies and small companies. Yeah, promotion in, I believe, in, in corporate spaces um, is very different than academia, right? It's really not based on how hard you work. It's really not based on the quality of your work always. In a lot of cases, it's based on your social networks and your interactions. That's right. And so I think that's a key reason why women and, and underrepresented minorities um, find themselves at a ceiling is because um, there are just certain structures in place that limit the extent of your social interaction mm -hmm. um, with others that are, you know, in those higher echelons of, of, of the C-suite. And so what I'm trying to do is figure out a way if there's a, we can facilitate those connect, connections. And that's why I call it executive match and not executive search. Right. Because I have a theory that a lot of challenges with bias and with, with limitations in social access are just due to lack of exposure. Again, you know, with the ways in which, um, you know, we tend to stay within our same train, our same social stratification throughout our entire lives, I think the way to hack it is just to facilitate um, connecting people of different social strata and different identities um, in a way that makes sense, in a way that isn't forced or it doesn't feel, um, you know, inorganic. Uh, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do that by leveraging data. Uh, so we'll see. I, you know, it's a, it's a huge social problem that doesn't necessarily have a clear technological solution. But um, we're trying to leverage people analytics in the meantime until we can, you know, really hack it. You know, Stephanie, it reminds me of like the social graph. And I know there's a number of researchers who have shown that social graphs, you know, it's, it's really, for example, if you're connected to, you know, people who are smokers, you're more likely to smoke, uh, you're much more likely to adopt the behaviors positive or negative. And, you know, maybe I could ask you to dig a little deeper on that. Like, how do we get these social networks to sort of overlap a little bit more like do you bring people together to to share break bread together is it you know more sort of informal conversations like especially in times of COVID how are you sort of bringing these very disparate social networks that kind of stay separate uh together yeah our our awareness of sociometrics today is primarily through social media so obviously mm -hmm. Facebook has figured this out uh, really, really well. And um, more often than not, sociometrics are used for the purposes of marketing. But within the context of human resources or human connections, 
we're trying to leverage some of the research that has actually come out of MIT about the ways in which different social networks overlap. So more often than not, there's certain nodes that exist in our networks that overlap. Um, and if we can figure out a way to facilitate connections on the outer rim of those social networks based on that interior node, I think there could be an opportunity. And when I say node, it doesn't necessarily have to be a person. It could be an interest. It could be uh, a core value. It could be, uh, you know, I don't know, I'm a backcountry skier. And it wasn't until I posted something on LinkedIn uh, about a speaking engagement I'm doing about backcountry skiing, I got inundated with messages from people that I may not have otherwise interacted with, but we had this common node. Um, <laughs> that, frankly, I think a lot of people think are unexpected. Uh, it's not unexpected to me, but there, you know, I think there's some underlying, um, there's some underlying things that we haven't yet figured out yet that can bring people together uh, beyond just common race and gender. That is beautiful, that the social graph is not just about demographics, but it's about things that we care about. And, and that sometimes is even more powerful than, than just our you know, cultural upbringing and whatnot. It's like the things that are, you know, draw our hearts in. Um, I'm going to ask you one more question before I hand it over to the students, because I know there's a, a backlog of uh, Q&A questions coming up. Um, I'm very curious uh, how Speaking of upbringing, how, um, how how that experience growing up with your mother, with your aunt, how that gave you uh, soft skills or hard skills to be such a successful entrepreneur? Yeah, um, so I am the descendant of American slaves. Uh, I guess we've been in this country for 10 years whenever we got off that ship. Um, and I think that more than anything and just the ways in which my grandfather's grandfather um, uh, integrated into society, um, mm -hmm. coming off of a very challenging past. So my mother actually went to a predominantly white school and this was in the sixties. So this was, it was part of this sort of early integration. It wasn't busing um, like that Kamala Harris uh, point, pointed out during her election, but it was a very unique situation that I think actually has more to do with where I am than anything else. Like my grandfather, for whatever reason, moved in somewhere in rural Michigan and his children um, all had names like Stephanie, um, mm -hmm. which are culturally ambiguous, right? And my mother's name is Cindy. Um, and I speak in a way that if I talk on the phone, you might not know what race I am, right? So those things I think um, have more to do with my trajectory than anything else. Wow. But United States social factors, as they may, um, led to my mother at one point, despite being college educated, being homeless at one point. Um, and that's kind of how we ended up moving to the Washington, D.C. area. She moved in with her sister, the computer scientist. Um, and that's how I got that early exposure to tech. But growing up below the poverty line very early on in life, it just gives you a resourcefulness that you can't you can't learn. Um, you're constantly thinking about how to stretch things and, mm -hmm. and make it work and, um, and hack and find alternatives, like skills that ironically, a lot of corporations say they value, but, you know, they're hiring, you know, mostly people who never were forced to be that resourceful. Um, so there, there are a lot of things that I think about, you know, that I think my background um, has to do with, with where I am, but uh, probably the most impactful was my grandfather's decision to move into predominantly white spaces. Wow. Wow. Well, it took courage from multiple people over many generations to, to get to you, which is just so beautiful, so beautiful to see. So I'm going to go into Q&A. There's a number of questions that I think you'll see in front of you. I'm going to read them out so that everybody can hear them. And we'll go through as many as we can in the next 10 minutes. All right, so the first one that was at the very top of the list is, could you talk more about how you've been able to be successful without raising a ton of capital from VCs? Has that been by choice, by circumstance or something else? And are you happy you ended this with this route and will you stay on that path? Ooh, that was a lot, okay. So um, the fact that we've only raised $1.5 million, I would say half of it is uh, by circumstance and half is by choice. 
Uh, mm-hmm. with, within the first couple years of uh, running the company and trying to raise capital, um, I realized that, okay, trying to do this as a Black woman is going to be really challenging, and I'm not up against a meritocracy. So similar to my experience when I was interviewing for a job and got rejected, um, I'm very astute to um, realizing when I'm operating in a space that's not a meritocracy, and I immediately mm-hmm. exit because it's not a good use of my time. So yeah. I have totally exited. I won't even take a meeting with most VCs. I'm just over it um, altogether. It just, it's a horrible, horrible use of my time. Um, and so now I would say over the past few years, it's been by choice. Uh, but what I have been successful at doing is finding foundations that do PRIs. So PRIs are called Program Related Investments, and it's basically a financial vehicle where foundations who typically only do grants to nonprofits can Mm -hmm. invest in social impact ventures. Um, So that's proven to be really successful for us. We got a PRI from ECMC, and we're pursuing a few Mm -hmm. other foundations. Um, And then uh, I've just been really successful with um, angel investors, so high net worth individuals who are just really passionate about this. Um, And they're not all women. Actually, some of our biggest angel investors are, you know, white, cisgender, straight men who just realize that there's an inefficiency in the marketplace. Um, So that's proven to be far more successful. Uh, Moving forward, I will probably not actively pursue um, traditional institutional capital because I, I honestly feel like there needs to be a signal to the market that they're missing out on something. Um, it, for any of you uh, who are unfamiliar with the VC industry, the first thing that they'll tell you, it's a very fear driven industry. People like latch on to deals uh, primarily for the fear of missing out than really understanding the workings of the business. I think, you know, that's why Theranos actually became uh, really successful at raising capital because it's just it's just it's emotional driven. Um, and so. I think in order for people like me to succeed and have it easier when I'm, you know, long gone and dead is if I'm able to get to a successful exit IPO acquisition and yield 10x returns to our investors and showing that I was able to do it without traditional VC. Mm. So that's my goal. It's harder. I'm, I'm not advocating for that route, but I kind of have a story that I'm trying to tell. That's bold. That is so bold. I, I think there's a misconception sometimes with our students that VC money is the way to go, right? And the more you raise, the better, right? And and yet there are so many sources of capital out there yeah. that oftentimes are untapped or just less well known because it's not what's being seen in the media. So thank you so much for paving the way and demonstrating that. Yeah, absolutely. And again, it's harder. I don't want to like glamorize it, but I've raised a half a quarter of a million dollars from pitch competitions alone. And that Mm -hmm. is dilution free capital. Um, So yes, there are alternative means for sure. Very cool. Very cool. All right. Next question. How did you incentivize companies to want to get a good score? I would imagine getting the first companies on board would be difficult because nobody else is using the score. Mm. Um. Well, we actually released the score about two years into the company and we had got, we received just a ton of organic press and attention. So I would probably say the key was building a brand, a very well-known and well-trusted brand before creating the score. If you create the score first, you're right. No one cares. They don't know who you are. Forget about it. Um, But because we had built some reputation before that, it helped. And for the most part, you're right. Most companies don't really care about the score itself. They're in fear. So you'll notice I use the word fear here a lot. They're more so fearing that people like you will come into an interview and say, I looked at your blend score and I'm a little concerned about how well you're accommodating women um, who become mothers. Can you speak to that? Like, that is what they fear. And so that's why when you saw my goals, it's about reach and impressions. Um, and so we're white labeling the score with Indeed and Career Builder and actually a couple other sites this year so that blend score becomes a little bit more well known. Um, we're also doing things like releasing reports. So um, I can't talk about it publicly yet because there's a big story coming out, but we will be releasing a big report 
um, on the state of diversity in tech. So we're really doubling down on the brand and the reach of our content um, mm -hmm. because we know that the only thing that companies are really worried about is not getting access to the best talent or not being considered the best company to work for. Here, 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 here. I love what you said about just building the brand and it's about building trust with your audience first, right? And then you have the credibility to be really open and transparent about uh, uh, the score, which is amazing, amazing. All right, uh, next question. How do you prevent candidates from lying about their backgrounds on your platform? There are some people always trying to, uh, well, it went away. <laughs> it, where did it go? Okay, um, trying to get the system. We're seeing it now with the wealthy cutting the COVID-19 vaccination lines. That's a great question. That's a pretty punchy question. So um, in a lot of cases, in a lot of cases, wealthy people are gonna find a hack. Um, they built the system, they made the rules, they get to figure out loopholes. It's kind of how this country has been founded and how it's going to persist. However, um, for the remaining 99% of us, um, I do think that you're going to see a growing trend um, in validation. So mm -hmm. whether it be LinkedIn, I think LinkedIn has start, started this with their whole like endorsements, but mm -hmm. um, I, I do believe like the future of work is increased validation of skills mm -hmm. um, and ability and, and personality and um, you know, all sorts of, you know, Enneagram or M, uh, what is it, the ESTJ, the MBTI? Um, yes. I think Myers you're gonna see Myers Briggs. Yes, I think you're going to see more and more of that for this very reason. Because um, you're right, right now it's the wild, wild west. I can say whatever I want, and you know, the company just has to take me at my word. Uh, which, for the record, is why it's harder for people of color to to get through the screening process uh, because we don't get the benefit of the doubt when we say that we can do a thing. Uh, but certain people do. And I think companies are realizing they're losing money as a result of that, hiring people who are not being completely honest about their abilities. And so you're going to see more and more and more investment in, um, in validation systems. Very good. Very good. All right. Uh, next question. How does entrepreneurship coming from a Stanford engineering background feel different then Stanford entrepreneurs with scientific and humanities backgrounds. And how has the Stanford community, classes, instructors, peers, et cetera, specifically influenced you as an entrepreneur? Ooh, I'm sorry, guys. I'm probably only get get like one of these two-part questions. I have <laughs> a little bit of like, uh, is it Dory from Finding Nemo? Like short-term memory loss. Okay, so I can't speak too well on the difference from sciences versus engineering, but I do know that a lot of my peers who went into the natural sciences, oftentimes um, there was a much easier progression for them to go into a PhD program and they did. And going from a PhD program to a startup in this day and age, so I get it, it worked in like the 2000s and, and 90s, but in this day and age, it's really tough in part because you can no longer just be a really smart C C CEO. Um, you have to be charismatic. You have to understand, you have to be very multifaceted. You have to understand many, many aspects of the business and not just the science. Like it's, it's hard. It's hard being super, really strong, super strong in your domain and garnering the broad support that's needed. Um, and I think that's a little bit more unique to the sciences than it is to engineering because engineers and, and granted, I'm an industrial engineer, basically, um, Stanford calls it management science and engineering, but it's industrial engineering. Um, it's a bit more frictionless um, for us, I think, in terms of uh, getting into uh, getting into tech early. So we're we're not quite as pressured to go into a PhD program or even grad school for that matter. Um, and so we oftentimes are just immediately thrown into the gauntlet, and we get the experience, and we build the networks, and we build the soft skills that I think are necessary to get, um, you know, to get, to get a venture uh, back basically is, is what I would say. But um, 
I don't think that's fair. I don't think it should be that way. Um, I think there just has to be more intentionality on the part of the venture capital industry to recognize that um, that this is happening, that the bias is happening and, and figuring out a way to mitigate it. Fascinating. I, I would agree. I, I would agree that Stanford and engineering does throw us into the gauntlet with projects, <laughs> working in teams and all that stuff that we benefit from. All right, one last question and I'm gonna close with mine. So this one's a good one. Uh, you are naturally this incredibly charismatic person. And we're curious, this, the question really is about how did how do you pitch? Like when you're pitching to somebody who you are hoping would invest in you, how, how, how do you pitch the opportunity? Mm. Um, I could, I'll, I'll send, I did a 60 second elevator pitch uh, show. Uh, it's like a shark tank, but you're in an elevator. So I can share the link in the chat um, if, if I can find it. Um, how do I pitch? Uh, I've developed the, I've developed the art of the story arc. Mm -hmm. And that has actually come from growing up in a black church where oh. it's very common for people to stand up and give a testimony. And these testimonies are elaborate. And so I think subconsciously, given I grew up in that environment, I've developed the keen ability to tell a story. Because as we know, there's research that stories resonate in our brains. We remember stories more than we remember just pitches. So I think when I am pitching, I try to tell a story that makes sense so that they understand exactly why this is a problem, why I am the best person to solve this problem um, what in, in my team, and why it's a big deal right now. So that's like, that's sort of the, the three big things of sales. It's like, why you, why anything, why now? Um, and so I've just, I've just figured out a way to weave a story into it that um, I think has led, you know, led to a lot of our success. Beautiful. One last question. Uh, for me, which I always ask at the end of these sessions. So some time ago, you were sitting in the seat, well, maybe not virtually like this, you were mm -hmm. sitting in the seat of our students, right? Uh, you were once upon a time 20 years old. Uh, if you could go back to that time and have a conversation with a 20 year old Stephanie Lamkin, what would you tell her? Well, I would tell her to be more aggressive in making friends outside of my cultural comfort level. So I, at Stanford, I stayed in Uj, uh, Ujma. I was, uh, you know, actively a part of like the Black Community Service Center. I, I kind of stayed in my bubble. Um, and there are many reasons for that. I don't fault my younger self for that. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, um, low SES and first gen, gen college students just have a totally different experience on these campuses than everyone else. And so I think I needed that bubble, but I wish I would have branched out more. I mean, my classmate, same major, same year, is Kevin Systrom. Like, I saw this dude all the time. And so I think I was entering MIT when he sold to Facebook for a billion dollars. And I read it and I'm like, how, I knew this guy. How could I not become friends with this guy? Like, what was I doing with my life? But I realized, you know, I was, I was focused too much on my own comfort instead of fully leaning into the just amazing people around me that didn't look like me. Yeah. yeah, here, here. It's all about those social graphs and, you know, taking that step to take a risk and going to another bubble and on the social graph. Yeah, exactly. Beautiful. Well, we're uh, at time. So uh, thank you again, everyone, for a great ETL session. Uh, we will see you next week, same bat time, same bat place, and thank you again. If you are looking for recordings in the past 25 years or so, they are all at etl.stanford.edu. Thank you again.